Have you ever wondered how some agents make millions and millions of dollars every single year in this business while other agents struggle? Well, I'm going to share with you in this video the 12 steps to millions specifically regarding lead follow-up. Hi everyone, Robert Villanueva here. As always, I'll see you at the top. All right, so let's get into this. So as far as making millions in this business, I want you to understand that there's um, one of the biggest things in regards to our industry as to how agents make lots and lots of money. Well, a good percentage of it is simply the fact that they have their lead follow-up system down pat. Okay, As you and I know, leads are very rare. Okay. So when you start to accumulate these leads, you want to make sure that you're taking care of them. Because if you don't, these leads, unfortunately, are going to go by the waste aside. So we're going to talk today in detail about how to create a foolproof system that's going to preferably not allow some of these leads to fall through the cracks. Okay. Now, let's start with the very first point. There's 12 key points. And the very first point that I want to talk about today is defining with what is the lead. This is important, okay? And it's important because unfortunately, a lot of realtors make the mistake of identifying um, a, a potential, a maybe, uh, and eventually a hopefully maybe at some point in time, but they're not a lead. So we have to make sure we identify with what is a lead, okay? Now, there's so many variations to this. My personal definition of a lead is someone looking to buy, looking to sell, or looking to invest, ideally within the next 30 days. So, Robert, what about the people that are on the other side of 30 days? Well, it's going to be under one of two things. Number one, if it is because of a condition. Okay. If it's someone that's on the other side of um, 30 days and it's a condition, what's a condition? A condition is no matter what, we can't overcome it, whether it be for tax liability purposes, whether it be because they want to move forward. Unfortunately, they're you know uh, pregnant and now they're on maternity leave. They're waiting for a job transfer. The person that was going to help them purchase, unfortunately, has passed. All of these things are with what are called conditions. They're basically things that we can't overcome. If they are um, with what I call is an objection, somebody who's just sitting there, I'm waiting for the market you know, to shift, I'm waiting for the interest rates, I'm waiting for all of these things. Well, those people, I put them in my suspects category. <laughs> so there is the definition of a lead, someone looking to buy or sell in the next 30 days, or there are the conditional people that um, are, in a sense, considered to be leads. They're going to be looking at making that move. However, they got to wait until their son or daughter actually ends up graduating high school, which is not until the end of next school year. And then and only then they're going to go ahead and move across country. So those are kind of examples. And of course, the third one are suspects. We're going to talk about the suspects here in just a little bit. But with what I want you to understand is, is that 70 80, and even in some extreme cases, that 90% of your business is going to come from lead follow-up. So this is why it's important. And number two is exactly that point. Number two is 70 to 80% of your business is going to come from lead follow-up. And with this lead follow-up, if you don't have them clearly defined, you're going to find yourself going through these non-leads, these suspects, as I've spoken about, um, and they're just going to be in the position of being in the way. Now, what I also want you to do is I want you to create some version of a prioritization. And what I mean by a prioritization is basically to A, B, and C your leads. Now, an A lead for me is someone that's looking to do something right away. Okay. Now, um, for me, going back to the 30 days, if someone is looking at buying or selling in the next 30 days, they are an A lead for me. A B lead is someone that's a little bit further out. A B lead is kind of going back to an example of the person that I identified that they're uh, doing something down the road six months, 
but it's a condition. They're waiting for their job transfer. They can't move until they get their job transfer. So that's probably more of a B lead, if you want to call it that, or for that matter, even a buyer. Um, you know, if it's a buyer and they're waiting for their income tax refund, they're waiting for their job promotion, they're waiting for them to save X amount of dollars. So those people can be identified as a B lead. And then the C leads, if you want to call them that, are everybody else. Okay, so you want to be able to create some version of a prioritization. And that ABC helps me a lot because what that now does is it creates a hierarchy. And in that, that hierarchy, I know exactly who's going to be at the front of the line, who's in the middle of the line, and who's at the very back of the line. Number four, we have to be in a position where we're constantly looking at promoting of our leads. And what I mean by the promoting of our leads, I'm talking about taking the C people and turning them into B people, the B people and turning them into A people. Okay, Because people's lives change. Circumstances, situations change all the time. The person that's actually waiting for their job transfer ends up getting a promotion instead of a job transfer. The person that um, you know got really excited about buying their first home because they just got married, well, come to find out they're now four or five or six months pregnant and they don't want to quite time it up with um, going through the pregnancy. So all of these circumstances end up being in a position where you know the Bs become Cs, the Cs become As, the Bs become As, um, so on and so forth. You want to constantly look at the evaluation of that. Okay. Number five. I'm going to go into the depthness of this. I'm a little bit of a, I don't want to say so much of a dinosaur, but I've been in the business now since 1999. Okay? And in that, I've had the most robust CRMs. I've had, you know, the top notch, every single last bell, every single last whistle of a CRM system. Well, I've also been in a position, even though I've had them, my staff has actually locked me out of the CRM. Okay. And why is that? Is because I've done things a little bit more old school. So I'm going to give you something that's very simple. And the reason I'm going to share this with you is because I know some of you are just getting started in the business. You don't have the resources in a sense to get a CRM. It's probably a little bit more complicated than you want to. So I'm going to keep it very simple. What I basically would do is have this binder system. And in this binder system, believe it or not, since 1999, it's, you know, as I'm recording this, it's now 24 years in the business. I've gone through, I realized just the other day, three binders. <laughs> so these three binders in the last 24 years has made me probably around 25 to maybe about $28 million in real estate. So I don't know, you know, the binder system for me works. I'm hoping it works for you. So let's talk about this. What's the binder system? There's a three ring binder. There's also tabs one through 31. There's also a second section, which has the tabs January through December. So in the first half, you have the tabs one through 31. That represents the days of the month, January 1st, January 7th, January whatever. Okay. Now, how do I use this? The way that I basically use this is as I go ahead and put these people on a sheet, don't overcomplicate that part either, okay? Name, phone number, address, what is their motivation, all that other good stuff, the time. And, you know, I put that sheet in my three ring binder. Okay? I, I do, of course, have something that's a little bit more fill in the blank kind of a thing, if you want to call it that, but don't even overcomplicate that either. In that, I take the sheet. If I sit there and I say, Joe, hey, it's Robert, the realtor, just checking in with you. Just wanted to see if you guys are ready to go ahead and get on the market so we can move, get you guys moved. Joe says, you know what, Robert, we're pretty close. We're just doing this. We're just doing that. Do me a favor, though. Um, give me through this weekend, and then why don't you call me next week? As an example. Now, let's say for uh, that example that now it's the 12th. Okay, so I look at my binder, I get Joe, and I put him on the 12th tab, 12th tab. I completely forget about it until that actual day. So whatever today is, is where that tab actually opens up. So I put these people, in a sense, in there. Okay, now, <clears throat> the second half of that is January through December. As I've talked about, there are some people that are going to be a little bit longer termed, or for that matter, some people that will sit there and say, wait until after the holidays, give me a call closer to summer, um, whatever those things in a sense may be. 
But what I do is I put them according to whatever we agreed to in terms of following up. Okay. Now, when I do this, um, I want to make sure that I do actually set that time in advance. And when I set that time in advance, listen to this. This is really important. Anything that is on the other side for me of three months, if they sit there and say, let's say it's January, and they say, call me in the summer, that's about six months out. I'm going to cut it in half. Okay, so I'm really going to call them in three months. Now, I know that they said to give them a call in the summer, and let's say they were specific about give me a call after June or July, whatever it may be. I'm still going to cut it in half. Remember, we talked about that there is the ever so often that people's situation, situations change. So in that conversation, when I call them in three months from now, even though they said six months from now, is I basically just go through, Joe, hey, it's Robert, the realtor, just wanted to check in with you. I know you mentioned to me to give you a call back right around June or July. Well, I just want to make sure that we're still on track for that. I just wanted to give you a quick little buzz. I was thinking about you, whatever that may be. Majority of the time, they're going to appreciate that, okay, because they know that you're not trying to push them. You're just confirming it. Ever so often, once out of every 25, 30, 40, or 50 people, I'll get somebody that'll sit there and say, hey, Robert, I'm so glad you actually called me. We decided to do things a little bit sooner, okay? So again, remember, this three-ring binder has tabs 1 through 31, and then there's also the tabs that are January through December, okay? There's also the third section. And in that third section is with what I call is my master one-liner. That master one-liner is a collect all of everyone. And what do I do? It's basically just an Excel spreadsheet. On that Excel spreadsheet, it's just very simple, name, phone number, address, maybe an email. And then I'll put a quick little note. Joe was thinking about making a move over to Syracuse, New York um, by the end of whatever the year was, okay? What do I do? When do I call those people on the C list? There's no rhyme or rhythm on those people. Okay. It's just a collection of names. These people, remember, they're not leads, they're suspects. If I have a hundred people on that list, I'll be lucky if I get two or three people that come off of that list of a hundred people that actually perform. So I'm not really banking on that. Okay. Going back to when do I call them? Well, I basically just kind of call them usually in that late afternoon um, when I don't have anything going on. I don't have an appointment. It's now 2.30, 3 o'clock. I did most of the things that I committed myself to do for the day. And um, well, what do I do? Should I go and perfect my flyer? <laughs> nope. Should I call my database? Absolutely. Okay. But I'm also going to find people that, okay, let me call a handful of these people on this list and I'll go through six, seven, eight, 10, 12. There's no rhyme or rhythm behind this. And I just go from the top, work my way down. And then by the time I've exhausted that, I'll go through it again. Okay. How often do I call them on a weekly basis? I'll go through that list maybe two, maybe, maybe three times out of the week. Okay. Um, you don't want to go through and overkill it, but you at least have an alternative source. Okay. Now that's the binder system, which is key number five. Okay. So step number five, number six, let's talk about this. Why do we do a poor job and lead follow-up? I'm asking you, why do we do, why do you do, well, maybe not you, but why do agents actually do a poor job and lead follow-up? The reason that they do a poor job and lead follow-up is because of the consistency or inconsistencies behind it. Unfortunately, a lot of agents will find themselves where they'll do some version of lead follow-up on Monday, they'll do it again a little bit on Thursday, they'll do it again the next following week on Wednesday, and then they do it again the week after that on Tuesday, and it's just kind of like all over the place. Well, Part of it is because sometimes it's a little discouraging when you're picking up the phone, calling these people, no, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. Well, you have too many bad leads, okay? And if you remember with what I was talking about earlier in regards to that suspect list, I wanna get people moved on to that list as quickly as possible. As much as I wanna pull them off the, the, the C list, but I wanna put them on that list as quickly as I possibly can. Let me give you an example. 
you have 100 people that you would consider to be leads. And out of the 100 people, let's say that there's only five that are actually going to do something in the next three months. If you knew exactly which five they would be, wouldn't you pay closer attention to them? Wouldn't you probably put the other 95 a little bit further on the back burner? Wouldn't you be really targeted on those five? I know I would. Well, we don't know. We don't know exactly which of those are going to be the five. But what we can do is we can kind of trim a little bit of that fat. And maybe we take the 100 and we bring it down to about 40. And of those 40, now five out of 40 is a way better ratio than the five out of the hundreds, especially if you're the kind of person that unfortunately doesn't do lead follow-up every day. Every single day, you should be doing some version of lead follow-up, even if you're new, even if you are a newer person and you don't have so-called leads, call some of the suspects, <laughs> okay? But you have to be able to build some consistency. And as you start to accumulate these names and numbers, as you notice, I'm not calling them leads. As you start to accumulate some of these names and numbers and suspects, eventually, eventually the creme de la creme will end up showing up. And those are the stronger people. Okay. Well, that's the thing we want to make sure that we avoid is the, uh, the collecting of these names. Let's talk about number seven. Number seven is... What is the most important question at lead follow-up? What's the most important question? The most important question, especially when it's somebody that you've been working on following up, following up, following up, following up, following up, and then following up, and then following up. <clears throat> My favorite question, write this down. What is stopping you from making the move right now? What is stopping you from making the move right now? Why is that the most important question? Number one, because it's a confrontational question. Number two is because they can't give you anything other than ideally with what is stopping them. And in that, you're going to get one of two responses. Number one is a condition. Remember that? Okay. And the condition could be valid. You know, I, I, we just don't have enough money. Okay. We are um, dealing with, you know, the, uh, the job transfer, unfortunately, fell through. Okay? There was delays in um, making the move that we were anticipating. And unfortunately, you know, where we were looking at moving to, they ended up closing down that company. Um, my son or daughter has not picked the college yet. And we don't know if they're going to go to Texas, New York, or Washington. So there's a lot of, of course, variables involved in that. Those are conditions. Number two, the second response you're going to get is going to be sometimes an objection. And the objection are things that ideally, if you're strong enough, as I've talked about before, the language of sales. And number two is objections. And in those objections, if you're strong enough, you should be able to overcome them. Okay? Not always. And I get that. Trust me. I know exactly with what... Um, what some of those situations and the, the responses that they give you. But in some cases, they're going to give you objection after objection after objection after objection. And ideally, you should be able to learn how to, or you should have learned how to respond to those objections. We're, let me give you an example. We're thinking about it, but you know what? We don't know if the timing of it with all of the uncertainty in the market makes sense to do it now. So we're just going to wait it out. I understand. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I totally get with where you're coming from. However, let's do this. Why don't we go ahead and get together? Let's take a look with what are some of your concerns. Now, what I want to do is if what I say does make sense, and I do want you to feel, of course, comfortable, and I do want both of you to feel confident that I can get the job done, I just want to be able to earn your business. What that basically does is it puts them on, takes them off of the fence and more of a certain position. So now instead of them sitting there giving you the constant check back with me, check back with me, check back with me, that is where now what we're doing is we're getting them to make some version of a commitment. Number eight, number eight is exactly with what I'm talking about. And number eight is managing versus closing. 
are you managing leads or are you closing on your leads? Because the managing of your leads is this constant, like pushing them forward, pushing them forward, pushing them forward. And what does that look like? This is a weak agent, a weak agent, Mr. And Mrs. Seller. Hi, this is Robert just giving you a call. Just wanted to check and see if uh, you guys were ready to go ahead and make that move. Oh, you're not ready. It's okay. Don't worry about that. I'll check back with you. Should I do it maybe another month? Hey, you know what? Let me give you two months. I'll just, you know, I'll check back with you in a couple of months. And then you keep doing that and again and again and again and again. And then all of a sudden they stop answering the phone. And then you see the property showing up on the MLS. It's not fun, right? You got to stop managing leads. You got to start closing on these people. You got to start closing and getting and setting these appointments. Don't do that. Let's talk about number nine. Number nine is reselling their motivation, especially for some of these that you've been following up on for three months, six months, a year, two years, three years, five years. You got to resell them on their motivation. I've talked about this in other videos. Write this down. Who? What? When? Where? Why? How? And if? These questions, or at least these words, will initiate questions that are going to be ideally in the direction of their motivation. Now, what I mean by reselling them on their motivation is, is that they gave you the idea, the concept that they are making a move over to, example, Florida. And they're making a move to be closer to family. They want to make a move to Florida. They want to be closer to family. But that's it. That's all you have. They might have said maybe next year. Now you can ask questions of what's the benefit of making this move? Why is this move so important? How is making this move going to benefit you and your family? Who in your family is actually most excited about you making this move? If we could get your home sold before the end of summer, would that be something you would consider? Now asking these motivating questions is going to put you in a position where ideally they'll give you some version of a response to those questions. And now you can actually put, the, put yourself in a position where you can close on them a little bit better. What's the benefit of making this move? Well, I want to be closer to my mom. How often do you see your mom? Uh, well, we see her for the holidays. Are you saying two, maybe three times a year? Yeah. Well, how does mom feel about that? Oh, she doesn't like it. Well, how would she feel if you actually made this move? Oh my gosh, she would be super excited. Well, what's stopping you from making the move? I don't know. We're just a little bit scared about the market. Well, here's the thing, Mr. and Mrs. Sellers, is that we're not getting any younger. Your mom would actually be pretty ecstatic about making this move. And, and I get it. I understand. Maybe right now might not necessarily make the best sense. But let's do this. Why don't we go ahead and get together so that I can go ahead and show you exactly the benefits of going on the market now. All I need is about 15 to 20 minutes of your time. Would it be better for me to stop by tomorrow or would Thursday at five be better for us to get together? Do you see how that actually puts you in a position where you can actually set it up and tee it up for a close? I think it does. Okay. Let's talk about number 10. When is the best time to follow up? I mean, like during the day, you know, Basically, you go into the office at eight o'clock all the way until about five or six o'clock. When is the best time? Any. <laughs> Any part of the day is perfectly fine. What I don't want you to do is this, because I see this mistake happen quite often. The mistake that I see that happens quite often is I will see in your schedule lead follow-up between one and two, as an example. And you keep calling the same person every single time between one and two. Yet, oddly enough, you found them by calling them at 8.30 in the morning. Okay. So what I mean by that is you have to look at the variation of the day. If you've called that person, they didn't respond at 1 o'clock. Well, the next day, try them again. But this time, try them in the morning. Well, Robert, aren't we supposed to be prospecting in the morning? Absolutely. But one of the things that I used to do that made me you know, uh, fairly successful was I would go through and I would call a source. As an example, I'd call the expireds. But here's the thing. Before I would actually shift over to another source, a la for sale by owners, between expireds and for sale by owners, I would actually squeeze in a quick little follow-up call with one or two people. Want to get a hold of them. As an example, I now go over to for sale by owners. 
I might try them again or not. Then I move over to another source, call my database or just listed or probates or whoever, whatever's, and then I'll try them again. And then guess what? Now between the hours of one and two, I'm now going to look at for today, I had seven people I needed to follow up on. At now it's one o'clock. I've actually spoken to five of the seven people. So I really only have to do two more people that I actually have to do lead follow-up calls to. Okay, so don't make the mistake of just calling them consistently um, between one and two. And especially if you're the kind of person that actually calls or does lead follow-up once or twice a week. Be careful with that. We're almost done here. Okay, so let's talk about two more points. Number 11. Number 11 is set a future follow-up day. Okay, set a future follow-up date. And what I mean by that is I'll check back with you at the beginning of March. I'll check back with you at the end of July. That'd be okay. Now, if you notice, I said it pretty vague, okay? Because some, some of you, unfortunately, will make this overcommitment. I'm gonna call you back on July 11th and I'll call you first thing in the morning. And then what do you do? Forget about them. And then you call them on July 15th and then they're annoyed because they actually wrote in their calendar, Robert is going to call me July 11th. Okay, so just keep it a little bit general, uh, general, whatever that word is. Keep it a little bit generic. <laughs> keep it a little general, okay? Let's go over number 12. This is the last point. You have to have integrity. It's basically it, okay? And what I mean by that is when you have to have, have that integrity is don't tell them you're going to call them a certain day, certain time, a certain whatever, and then you don't call them. They know I've been there. I've done that. I've done the, um, Joe, hey, it's Robert just reaching out to you. I called you a couple of days ago. I didn't leave you a voicemail, you know, but I just figured I'd try you back again. BS. They know you didn't call. Okay. Don't play those games. You have to have that integrity. Do you see how the binder now comes into play? Well, let's go over the points here real quick. Number one is to find what's a lead. Number two. 70, 80, even 90% of your business comes from lead follow-up. Number three, A, B, C, your leads. Create a prioritization. Number four is promote your leads. Take your Cs, turn them into Bs, turn the Bs and turn them into As. Number five, make sure you have a solid follow-up system. I'm talking about a binder system. You don't have to use this, okay? I'm just using this as an example. If you have a robust CRM, use that. Be my guest. Number six, why do we do a poor job of lead follow-up? Well, we have too many of the bad leads. So be careful on how many bad leads you are following up on. Number seven, what's the most important question? What is stopping you from making the move right now? What's stopping you from making the move right now? Number eight, stop managing leads. I want you closing on these leads and setting appointments. Stop, stop, stop with the managing of the leads. Number nine, resell them on their motivation. Who, what, when, where, why, how, and if. Ask them the question so that you can get to the point where you can close on them for an appointment. Okay, let's move on. N next one is, of course, number 10. What, uh, when is the best time to follow up? Just do it throughout the day. Okay, there is no perfect time. Just do it throughout the day. Number 11, set a future follow-up date as to when you're going to call them. Number 12 is have integrity. You have to have integrity. Too many agents, unfortunately, don't follow through with this. I'm hoping that this information was helpful. In the comments, in the um, information, you'll actually see that I did uh, input some other links to, of course, my, uh, my TikTok, um, Instagram, and my Facebook. Um, for those of you that are realtors, okay, I have a very special group where I do trainings probably about 15, 20 times a month. Would you like more training? <laughs> Well, it's, there's a link that's on there and the group is called Top Realtor Training. It's a private group on Facebook. So hopefully this video was helpful. And as always, I want you to make sure that you do, of course, subscribe. So do me a favor, subscribe. I want you to like, I want you to comment. And most importantly, if, you, if this has been helpful to you, please share it. Okay, I'm trying to, of course, grow my audience. So thank you so much for attending. And of course, as always, I'll see you at the top. Hi everyone, Robert Villanueva here. And of course, as always, I'll see you at the top.